Soft Black Star, Some Thoughts on Knowing Tom Ligotti, by David Tibet. I loved, when I was younger, a song called Darkness, Darkness. Recently, when I started my yearly spiraling back to childhood thought and teenage dreaming, I bought the new Robert Plant album, Dreamland, and I found there the same song, a cover of Jesse Colin Young's beautiful and melancholy ballad. I again immersed myself in that familiar and comforting shadow, the snow, the past, the formless beauty that comes with unshaped fears as we track the thunder and lightning whilst sitting safe inside, the fire burning, the clock chiming smilingly, the sound of stars flying into infinity, and comets crashing, watched in wide screen, unreal, a play, a film, a game. Youth flies to cozy darkness. In horror literature, this can be found best represented, this comfortable unease, in the works of M.R. James. Ligotti, however, breathes the air of another ethical and spiritual universe altogether. Like many other readers, my initial encounter with his work in his world was with the Robinson paperback edition of Songs of a Dead Dreamer, the expanded and revised version of the Silver Scarab edition of the same title. The first story in this collection is The Frolic. I was terribly disturbed by it to the degree that I was unsure as to whether to read any more of the book. It repelled me. Fittingly, a story so stilted and dreamlike began to invade my own dreams, and I found it difficult to pick up the book again. It frightened me very much, and I left it on a desk for some weeks, all the time thinking of those words of such strangely beautiful terror. For in the black foaming gutters and back alleys of paradise, in the dank windowless gloom of some galactic cellar, in the hollow pearly walls found in sewer-like seas, in starless cities of insanity, and in their slums, my awestruck little dear and I have gone frolicking. I think this is perhaps the most apocalyptic passage in horror ever written, equaled only by the entirety of Thomas de Quincey's Suspiria de Profundis, and, despite any protestations Tom Ligotti might have to the contrary, the banality of its fear, the squalid and stupid realism of that terror that permeates those words he wrote is far more unnerving to me than all of Lovecraft's idiot gods and horrific manifestations from the cosmic depths. In this sad and sick world in which we routinely hear of the existence of child murderers like the Belgian sadopedophile Mark Dutroux and disgusting killings such as those of two young girls in the small English town of Soham, those words of Tom's seem prophetic and so true to the ugly and unhappy lit of life in these decadent and degenerate end times. Every time I reread Tom's work, I am left wondering how anyone can have crafted something so individual and utterly alone and so true to life, despite its unimaginative filing in the fantasy sections of the bookshop and catalog. My nature is obsessive. 
This manifests in the usual way, in my trying to collect everything by and about those I admire, so I can be with them and walk with them in their strange and unique land. Most of the objects of my obsessions are deceased, but with those artists whom I admire and who still live, my real aim is to get to know them so I can be part of their world and see, at least temporarily, through their visionary eyes. I obtained Ligotti's home address through my friend Andy Richards of Gold Dunnage Books and sent him an admiring letter with a large selection of my albums. While I no longer have a copy of the letter, I recall that I told him that I thought he and I shared a similar view of the world in its heart, though we had drawn different conclusions. Both Tom and I saw a fallen world, but I believe in redemption. Tom had gone to that terrible place beyond worlds, beyond redemptions, beyond words, where even the silence was ferocious and painful. Nonetheless, I wanted to work with him and know him very badly indeed. Having kept all of the many hundreds of email letters between Tom and myself, I see that my first letters to him cover Tiny Tim and the rumor that Jim Carrey was to make a film about his life. Decadent literature, the making of the current 93 album, all the pretty little horses, which I then described to him as a current 93 album sung entirely in Gregorian chant, and comments made by my friend Timothy Darksmith, renowned historian of occult literature and late 19th century homosexual verse, who first introduced me to the works of Count Stenbach, and rare bookseller without equal, concerning the Golden Dawn and the secret sister organization he claimed existed for Adamites everywhere, the golden down. Tom once wrote to me that he was working towards achieving an effect in his prose style that would make his stories read as if they had been awkwardly translated from some Eastern European language into English. It impressed me enormously. He had struck exactly on that melange of menace and paranoia, inadequately decorated with a slight layer of forced charm that characterizes a whole genre of translation, where the threat of that strange force which strives to destroy our souls is masked as a quirky visitation of fate upon the smug world of the petty bourgeois. The stories of Stefan Grabinski may serve as an example of this phenomenon. Yet Tom has at times also claimed that he is absolutely in the tradition of H.P. Lovecraft and that H.P.L. remains for him his biggest influence and the greatest visionary in the world of the fantastic story. Though Lovecraft's importance cannot be denied, I see Ligotti's work as far more dreamlike, far more terrifying. His prose style has never struck me as anything less than sui generis. Where Lovecraft excites, Ligotti appalls. His world, though dreamlike, is intensely real, and it was fundamental in making me rethink the nature of the relationship between dream reality and waking reality, and drop the many cliches I had carried in my lexicon as to how dreams manifested other realities breaking through in mythic form. 
Now I saw dreams as the unstoppable influx of the other into the totality of our life, not merely small revelations of unearthly beauty with little meaning. Dreams were not only often absolutely real to me, but were now accurate representations of an absolutely trans-dimensional existence. Through them, I think I came as close to understanding hell as anyone can in purely magical terms. Tom took me sightseeing there, and the theological ramifications it had for my ideas have been enormous. Tom is erudite and unpredictable, as well as one who generously acknowledges those who have fired his work, and his influences on me have been many. He introduced me to the exquisite work, as bleak and beautiful as bone, of Georg Trackel, who remains one of my most loved writers, and one, like Tom, who exists in that crepuscular world between prose and poetry. He made me reread Choran, an author whom I enjoyed, though I thought, and still do, that the meaning that arises from the sum of his words doesn't match the ferociously cynical sonority of his language. He suggested the Romanian poet Bacovia to me, though I found that there were limits to the amount of literary misery that I could swallow. Tom gobbled him up, with his endless complaining meditations on funerals, the rain, women lying dead in the streets, their makeup running. I rather found Bacovia reminded me of Max Beerbohm's wonderful parody of a 19th century decadent English poet in Seven Men's Tale, Enoch Soames. He is a great admirer, too, of Nabokov, and recommended that writer's autobiographical masterpiece of melancholic reverie, Speak, Memory, which shares with Ligotti's prose a sense of dreamlike repetition and evanescent epiphanies, though there is little similarity between Tom's overwhelming bleakness of vision and the cultured and happily jaded middle Europa ennui that overlays Nabokov's meditations. Musically, Tom's loves are predictably unpredictable. Guitar instrumentals from predominantly the 1960s and surf guitar music. The shadows are a particular favorite of his. My bloody valentine he spoke highly of, and the moody blues. On another plane we met each other, shook hands under some lysergically fallopian moon, and shook heads in front of the speaker bins to Iron Butterfly's fantastic instrumental piece, Iron Butterfly Theme. But I still can follow him to the threshold of a dream or days of future past, thankfully. Yet, yes, the Yes album, Fragile, and Tales from Topographic Oceans still move me as much as Emerson, Lake, and Palmer's trilogy. I find it difficult to understand why anyone doesn't love these records. Luckily, I found Tom was one of those who share my admiration for those groups whose records are now found primarily in bargain bins and the ironic section of record collections. But, on balance, Tom would throw his hat into the more of the instrumental, less of the castrato corner of the musical world. But I love castrati. They are expensive to keep, but terribly grateful and kind. Despite Tom's several awards and praise for his work from such luminaries as Ramsey Campbell and Bobby Z. Bright, he has not gained the wider acceptance he deserves. 
this vast and diseased world full of dusty mannequins, soiled wallpaper, prosthetic fakes, and vampiric impersonations of the living is written in a mixture of the colors of cement and peacock. His characters move as shadow puppets move, badly and lit blurringly, through two-dimensional landscapes cast by dirty lights, tracked under malevolent, spiteful, starlacked skies. The ends to which our schemes and dreams come is of no importance, like our gestures and thoughts, pointless motions of body and mind in a universe of smeared fairground mirrors. This is the Gnostic nightmare par excellence. He is the greatest writer of our time in any genre, whether our eyes are closed to his abysmal vision of the overwhelming nature of the sadness and terror of things, or not. Epilogue, extract from a letter from Ligotti to myself. Thomas Ligotti, 12th January, 1997. I never heard of Tiny Tim's film, Blood Harvest, but it does sound like something I might find on the horror shelves of the local video store. <laughs> stay stupid, stay alive, those are my words to live by these days. I saw Mars Attacks, which absolutely sucked, and that's all that deserves to be said about it. David Tibet. 31 August 2002